reading this morning is from Philippians 3, verses 7 to 21. That's Philippians 3, verses 7 to 21. But, what, what, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through, Christ, through faith in Christ. The, right, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. I take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many, lie, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we may be like his glorious body. This is the word of the Lord. Wonderful, thank you so much to Piwa. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be back with you. And again, a really warm welcome if you're new here or haven't met you. Um, I have a whole new level of respect for any parents that make it to church on time. I now understand <laughs> how difficult it is to get here, um, but we're so grateful for this church family um, and to get to look at the word together with you today. Let's pray together and then we'll, we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence here with us now. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift that it is to us. We pray now by your spirit that you would open up our hearts and minds, that we would receive all that you have for us today, that we would leave here knowing more of you, Jesus, transformed by who you are and your word to us today. Amen. Amen. Well, it's the first Sunday after Easter. We had an amazing Easter celebration last Sunday, and it was St. Augustine, uh, the wonderful early church father, that said this. He said, we are an Easter people, and hallelujah is our song. We are an Easter people. And hallelujah is our song. And that's what I want us to think about today together. What does it mean to be an Easter people? Today, in light of the most important event in human history, as Paul wrote, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is worthless, and so is our faith. In light of the resurrection, I want us to consider a few things from our passage today. What does it mean to be an Easter people, not just once a year as we celebrate Easter, but to live in light? Of the, in the light of the resurrection. So firstly, the power of the resurrection. Now, confession time. When I was younger, me and my sisters, we often used to do kind of slightly strange deals with each other. I don't know, maybe you can be familiar with some of this, but I used to dabble in a little bit of um, pocket money finance hustle. Um, I used to convince my younger sister that her one pound coins, which were smaller than my two pence pieces, were therefore worth 
uh, less, and I could, you know, generously offer her my 2p coins, um, and she would make a profit. Obviously, that, that didn't last long. My enterprise closed down. Um, we also used to do this strange thing where we'd offer each other I think this is really weird, but we'd offer each other say, will you get me a drink from the kitchen and then I'll, I'll be your slave for a week. I don't know what being a slave for a week for each other really meant, but it was a deal we kept making. Essentially pretty meaningless trades with one another that were not worth very much at all. But in our passage today, and I can encourage you, if you've got your Bibles with you, keep it open or on your phones into Philippians chapter 3. It's such a rich, beautiful passage. We're just going to draw out a few things from there today. But in our passage, in Paul's letter to the Philippian church, we hear about a man who found something worth more value than anything the world could possibly offer him. This was no meaningless, dodgy deal. His world was totally turned upside down when he encountered the risen Christ. A man once known as Saul, who went from being a hater and persecutor, murderer of Christians, to then one of the most amazing leaders of the early church, writing so much of the New Testament that we still read today. He was willing to trade everything else for the power that was far greater than any other power he had encountered, the saving resurrection power of Jesus. That he could save verse seven, but whatever were gains to be now, I can now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And as an Easter people, we now live in the power of the resurrection. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but we forget what what the apostle Paul actually gave up to follow Christ. He says on early on in the passage, um, just leading up to this, in verse 4 of chapter 3, he says, if someone else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Then he lists his credentials, almost like his LinkedIn profile of his status of his day, of his uh, culture. He had a great religious career going for him. He was a top student, of the top teacher, top institution um, of his time. It's like perhaps being the top scholar here in Oxford, a fellow of All Souls Souls College with a great um, contract waiting for you, and that's wonderful if that is you today. But he was on track for amazing success. And so from the outside, what he gave up seemed completely ridiculous. But yet nothing could come even close to comparison with what he found when he encountered Jesus. In verse 8, he says, in fact, he counts everything he once knew as loss, even as being like rubbish, like utter garbage in comparison to what he encountered in Christ. So why was Paul willing to give it all up, to lose his reputation, risk alienation from his community, to be obedient from the call of, to the call of God upon his life, to endure the loss of status, hardship, and persecution? Why? Well, in verse 8 today, it says, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. You see, in Paul's economy, Christ is greater than everything. In fact, in Christ, he gets everything. He gains it all. No amount of his own righteous living, his own holiness under the law, could count for anything in comparison to a love supreme of knowing Jesus Christ and being able to say, my Lord. And this is what it means to be an Easter people with hallelujah as our song. And what's more, as I love about this, is that Paul doesn't say, you know, I count it all as lust for the surpassing worth of being used by God to be a teacher, or the surpassing worth um, for being known as a great Christian leader, the surpassing worth for serving in a church community, the surpassing worth for doing great deeds for God. No, simply yet profoundly, the surpassing worth of knowing him. Now when I see my um, five-month-year-old now, I can't believe she's five-month daughter, Madeline, me and my husband, Jack, we are beaming with pride when we look at her, yet she has done very little. Smiles, um, needs her nappy changing, needs feeding, that's about it. But we find ourselves most captivated by her, often when when she's asleep, mainly maybe because she's finally asleep, but in actual fact, it's those moments when we gaze upon her And we think, we didn't even know you five months ago. You're precious just because you exist. To know you is to love you. And I find in in those moments just glimpsing the tiniest fraction of the Father's heart towards us as his children, his love for us in just being 
made by him, being made in his image, being found in him. And this is where Paul goes on to explain it, and it just gets even more beautiful. He says, for his sake, I have suffered in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. To be found in Christ. It's the safest place we can be, to be found in his love, to be home, to be secure, knowing that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave was no match for the power of sin and death, that when Jesus died, when he was hung on the cross for our sin and our shame, when he died, he died once and for all. And when God loosed him from the powers of death, when he took back the keys, Satan was defeated and Jesus lives forevermore. He defeated death and rose in victory. And so when we accept his love into our life, when we turn from sin, receive his love, when we're baptized into this beautiful new reality, we can approach God with confidence and boldness as beloved children of God, not in our own merit, but because we've been found in him, found in Christ Jesus. And perhaps you're here today or you're watching at home and you might be counting the cost in a very real way of what it is to be found in Christ. Perhaps it's financial decisions you've had to make or relationship decisions or even just moving somewhere new that perhaps doesn't quite make sense. For me, a lot of my hesitation in actually coming to church for the first time as a student when I was thinking about whether or not I wanted to come back here after having walked away from God for a really long time. One of my biggest barriers was, in fact, this fear of my reputation, whatever my reputation might have been at that time. But it was this fear of, like, if I become a Christian, I'm going to lose all my friends. I'm going to be weird. No one's going to like me. And in actual truth, when I came into this building, I still had all of that going in my head. None of that had actually gone. But actually, it was encountering a love that surpasses anything else, encountering Jesus that actually this is the greatest exchange that we can ever make. And it's actually when we feel weak, when our faith feels small, when we can't quite see why things are going the way they're going, but when we come to Jesus in that place, that we get to meet him and his resurrection power. As Paul writes elsewhere in the letter to the Romans, he says, remarkably, it's the same spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, that it's that spirit that is living within us. Just let that sink in for a moment. That resurrection power is living within us today. Which brings me, secondly, to the mark of being Easter people. It's to know the joy of the resurrection that can sustain us in our day-to-day. The joy of the resurrection. Because to be Easter people isn't to just put off faith and trust in Jesus and then kind of lay back and chill and just live in the same way that we did before we encountered Christ. But it's actually to go on running a race Verses 12 to 14, he says this. He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of in me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Pressing on. He starts using this athletic metaphor, encouraging the Philippians that, are, that they are to race towards the finish line of their promised future, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus to run this race together. Now, when we hear the phrase, run the race, some of you might be like, yes, I get that. I'm here for my park run every week. I want to keep running the race for the Lord. For others, the idea of running for pleasure is your absolute nightmare. Why couldn't Paul have said, you know, the prize of the upward call of laying on a beach or the upward call of reading a book? But he doesn't. He says we're going to all keep running this race. But take heart. We're running a race where the winner has already been announced where Christ has won the victory. When we look to that first Easter Sunday, we know that the odds are eternally in our favor. But we're called not to take this incredible gift of grace for granted, to see it cheaply, and to just live like we did before, but to let the outworking of that resurrection power permeate every area of our lives. Knowing that your life is of infinite value and worth for Christ, that the joy set before him that for the joy set before him, you and me, he was willing to die for us to endure the cross. So in response to that, that incredible love towards us, we get to run with joy. Like the women who encountered Jesus on that first Easter day, they were filled with great joy and rushed to tell others, he is alive. The joy of the resurrection is that we can continue day by day living out the overflow of that love. But then how do we 
gain more of what we have already received? How do we know more fully the joy of the resurrection in our lives? How do we keep on running this race wholeheartedly when, in actual fact, we might be quite tired or not getting glimpses of this joy all the time? How do we live up to what we've already attained? Well, we've got a a beautiful example in our passage today. In verse 17, Paul says, we're to follow in the example of those godly men and women who have gone before us. He says, join together in following my example and keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So we can look to those who are running ahead of us, those who are running faithfully for the Lord. Corrie ten Boom has always been a faith hero of mine. You can read her story in a a book called The Hiding Place. I'm sure many of you have come across it. And just to give you a a bit of background on Corrie ten Boom, she was a Dutch Christian born in Holland in the late uh, 19th century, and her father was a watchmaker. They lived in a house where they had the watchmaking shop downstairs, and they lived as a family kind of in the the rooms upstairs. And courageously, her and her family during Nazi occupation, they worked um, amazingly to, to hide and shelter Jewish people and see them get out to safety until eventually she was caught, her and her family, and she ended up um, in a concentration camp. And amazingly, she survived, but the rest of her family suffered greatly. And remarkably, when she was released from prison, um, she went around the world preaching the message of God's love and his forgiveness, the wonder of the cross despite the suffering that she'd experienced, but his power of reconciliation and hope. But recently, what got me um, re-listening audiobooks, we love audiobooks at the moment, um, to, her, to her story was, in my head, I don't know why, I'd always pictured Corrie ten Boom um, when I, I kind of thought about her life as a really young woman when she was doing all this stuff. Um, but yet, it wasn't in actual fact until she was nearly 50, an unmarried woman still living in her family home, that actually she began this incredible work of sheltering Jews in her house. Now, it wasn't like she'd had no experience whatsoever in kind of stepping into the call that God called her into. And actual fact, if you look at the kind of life that she'd lived up until this point, they'd already been opening up their home to foster children. Their family had a strong rhythm of Bible and prayer and worship together. And through their watch business, they were connected as a network to the local community. They had experience, skills, um, yeah, in, in running a business. And I'm sure she'd say she learned so much in the years that followed and um, what she went through. But in actual fact, no doubt, so much of her willingness and her ability to follow Jesus, like Paul writes, to know the power of his resurrection, but also the, power, also the participation in his sufferings. It's not always something we want to sign up for, participation in his sufferings. But no doubt her ability to endure that through the trials she faced was built on the many years leading up to that point of small, hidden, faithful obedience of living for his glory in her day to day, of knowing the joy of walking with the Lord in the place that she'd been called to be. Her life is a radical example of beautiful faithfulness, faithfulness of a long life lived, living the race for the glory of the Lord. But it's lives like these that we need to look to more than ever today. And of course, running the race will look so different for each of us at different seasons of life. But however much we may or may not enjoy physical exercise, we know it is ultimately important for us to move our bodies to to be strong in some way. But the same goes for spiritual practices. In order to press on and run the race as Easter people with joy, we need to stay found in him, to take hold of what he already has taken hold of in us. And that's why rhythms of prayer, of reading the word together, of staying connected to our local community, our local church, getting plugged into groups, serving on team, being accountable, growing together in holiness is so important in running the race that we're called to press on ahead of. And so something so important about those hidden daily acts of obedience surrendered to him, wherever we find ourselves, whether that's at home, in the workplace, in a shop, working, wherever we've been placed faithfully to the Lord. You know, just because Paul gave up one form of his career to follow Christ, it didn't mean that all the skills that he'd acquired were wasted. No, in actual fact, they were managed to put being used for the glory of God. When Corrie reflected on her life, looking back, she said this, she said, I know that the experiences of our lives, when we let God use them, become the mysterious and perfect preparation for the work he will give us to do. So whether you've been following Jesus five days or 50 years, never underestimate what he can do through you when we live our lives surrendered to him, running the race set before us, as we begin to know more and more of that surpassing worth of knowing him, 
and experience his resurrection power and joy in our lives. Because finally, we press on towards heaven to that which we've been called to. So finally, thirdly, the hope of the resurrection. As Easter people, we have a promised future that awaits us. Those beautiful verses, verses 20 to 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious bodies. You know, we may not get to know many answers to the questions we face this side of eternity, but the promised future, the promised hope we have in the resurrection is that we one day too will rise again and that he will make all things new. And this hope isn't just wishful thinking or a nice idea. It's a concrete reality grounded in the promise that our, as Easter people, our citizenship is in heaven. And we need to, I need to remind myself that we need to be reminded of that, our citizenship, the spiritual reality of what we live in, that we belong to a different homeland, that we have a different set of allegiances to Christ our King. We have a different source of protection and deliverance under his authority. C.S. Lewis wrote an, uh, an amazing book called The Screw Tape Letters. Some of you will be familiar with it. But if you're not, it's a slightly strange but beautiful allegorical book written um, essentially as an older demon is teaching a younger demon in how to tempt a Christian. It sounds kind of strange, but it's a clever way of, I think, helping us understand some of this spiritual reality that we live in and where our true citizenship lies. And I just want to read a little bit to, it, to you from it. One of our great allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her, spread out through all time and space, rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patience sees, when he gets to his pew and he looks around him, he sees just a selection of neighbors which he has hitherto avoided. You want, him to lean pretty he you want to lean pretty heavily on these neighbors. It matters very little, of course, what kind of people that the, are next to, the, next to him really contains. You may know one of them as a great warrior on the enemy's side, no matter. Provided that any of those neighbors sing out of tune or have boots that squeak or double chins or odd clothes, the patient quite easily believes that their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. Keep everything hazy in his mind now, and you will have all eternity wherein to amuse yourself by producing to him the peculiar kind of clarity which hell affords. What a picture. The church spread out through all time and space, rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That word terrible, it can also be known in scriptures, awesome. The church spread out throughout all time and eternity, time and space rooted in eternity. You know, sometimes we can turn up on a Sunday or during our week and things can feel just a little bit hazy. We can be tempted to, to live in the same way as everyone else around us, perhaps just making small or great compromises in our faith, perhaps even fearful to admit that we're a Christian. Or perhaps when you're the only Christian in your family or your friendship group, it can be difficult. Or when we're bombarded by the daily news of all the, the terrible stuff happening in our world, things can become to feel a little bit hazy, this true reality of what we're called to. Perhaps even coming to church, you can be feeling a bit flat and hazy. Perhaps you are distracted by a neighbor singing out of tune, sorry if that's me. Um, or just little things that can get under our skin. And you know, the enemy loves to anesthetize us from the spiritual reality of the truth that we're called to. But friends, our passport, remember as Easter people, says citizens of heaven. We belong to Christ. It's part of his body here on earth, but also mystically united to all those that have gone before us and will come ahead of us. Part of the church of Christ. And when we set our minds on heavenly things, when we're reminded of the hope to which we are called to. It helps us to keep running this race, to know the joy of what it is to be Easter people. I'll admit, over the past few months, there's definitely been times where I've felt a bit hazy in my spiritual life, where after some sleepless nights, 
All I've been able to pray really is just help me, Holy Spirit. But I have been amazed when we come to him as we are and just invite his presence, invite his peace into our lives. There is a strength, there is a hope, there is the fruit of the spirit that he longs to cultivate in us even when we are weak. And he loves to come to this place to renew our intimacy and love for him. Because of the empty tomb, we worship a God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. We're not defined by our circumstances or situations, but by the one who is seated on the throne. So be reminded of this today. Whatever situation you might find yourself in, set your mind on things above. Look to eternity, to heaven. As Easter people, The resurrection of Jesus Christ tells us that we have a hope and an assurance that can never be misplaced. Wherever we go running this race, whether we feel like we're sprinting or barely getting along, we can still live hope-shaped lives, eagerly awaiting the return of our Savior. And in a world today where so many people are searching for something, trying to fill that void that we were made to be known and loved by God in other places, be reminded of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, of the extent of his love towards you as beloved children of God. Come back into his loving arms. Know the power of his resurrection and the hope to which we've been called to. And this is the amazing thing about being Easter people is that we get to take hold of what Christ has already taken hold of in us. We have this promised future, but we also have an invitation to put that hope into action into the world around us, to be a sent people with hallelujah as our song. Amen. Can I invite the band up? And we're going to do that. We're going to sing hallelujah as our song. We're going to worship the risen Christ. And then there'll be space to come and receive prayer and to meet with the Lord. So let's stand together and I'll pray.